Hello, welcome to the carving shop. My name is Joe Dillette. I'm owner of the carving shop and I'm carving a mantle for a customer up in the UP in, in Michigan. And um, I carved this mantle about 20 years ago uh, and uh, since then they had a house fire. Now they're rebuilding and they want another mantle to replace the one that I had carved. So uh, since then the family has changed a little bit. Uh, their daughter had won a national ski championship and that's a picture that he sent me and so uh, I am adding that to the mantle. The other, the theme of the mantle is all the things that they enjoy uh, in Michigan and it's mostly water sports. There will be sailing, fishing, snowmobiling, uh, skiing, uh, swimming, diving. Uh, so uh, the customer has approved the drawing. I will show you the sketch and I will show you also the end of the mantle, how the mantle is constructed by uh, laminating. We sandwich the layers all together. The unique thing about this piece of wood, it's eight by eight inches by about six and a half foot long. Uh, the customer approved me getting a little bit of sap wood on it. I like that contrast in the color. but. It, this all this wood came from the same tree. This makes it very uniform in color and in grain, uh, so that it makes the mantle kind of special. Also, we were able to select the wood, so there is no knots in this wood. I know I can go in over four inches deep, and I will not hit a knot. Really gives me a lot of freedom in the carving. So uh, uh, it's a very special piece of wood. I'm really excited to carve it and uh, excited to take you on the journey while I'm carving it. Here is the sketch of the mantle from left to right. And you can see the skiing, the snowmobiling, the fishing, a deer drinking out of the water. Uh, then that's the skiing and that's the daughter skiing. That's the photo he sent. And uh, as it continues on the sailing, I'm going to put some loons in the water. That was also his request. And uh, then the uh, diving off of a pier with a child sitting on the pier. Now checking out the end of the mantle, you can see the laminations and how the grain is reversed each time. Most cases they didn't have a board that wide so they edge glued it then we sandwiched it together. But what this here alternating the grain does is it neutralizes the stress. So the stress created from this board and the grain alternating uh, neutralizes the stress and you keep alternating all the way across until uh, so that way the mantle is not going to warp or bend or uh, change. With moisture it's going to expand and contract slightly and uh, that will be every. Now that the design is sketched down to the mantle I can begin the carving. I carve using chisels, the old world uh, method, and my chisels have different shapes on the end. This one has got a curve, uh, and I just drive it into the mantle. So in this first phase of carving, I'm going to rough it out and the first thing I do is I go to the depth of about four inches. Uh, so, And I work from the back towards the front. By going to the depth first then I know how much uh, wood I have to develop the scene. I want this mantle to be very dynamic. This tree is going to be very close to the surface. Right next to it is going to be like four inches deep. This background here on the other side of the lake is going to be probably about three inches deep and then working out towards to where I'm almost right out to the outer surface here. So that's how I develop the scene. So the first thing is to rough out all the wood to the back uh, to the depth first so I can work then towards the front. Now this piece on the top is going to be uh, like a shelf. I want to maintain that 8 inch shelf for the mantle top and uh, so 
uh, it creates a real nice shadow if I leave that shelf and I go plunge into that depth right here then that will make it look very dark and uh, like it's uh, very much in the distance. So talking a little bit about the tools. The tools that I'm using are the old chisels. Uh, they are uh, the same chisels, the same style chisels that was used 400 years ago. And they uh, are based on two shapes. One of the shapes is a gouge and the gouge has a curve and the curves uh, change uh, to a tighter curve or less of a radius uh, and uh, in width. The other shape is a V-tool, and the V-tool changes in angle, and it changes also in size. So the V-tools run down to that size, all the way up to maybe that size is what I use. Uh, then uh, there are a few other shapes, but those are the, the main shapes. There's also a veiner. The veiner is shaped like a letter U. And uh, then there is the straight chisel, which is, uh, there's no curve at all to it. That's a number one chisel. And I use the uh, mallets. This is a 20 ounce mallet. Now you see me swinging it. Here what I'm, uh, and you think 20 ounces is heavy where a rough end carpenter's hammer is maybe 18 ounce, but I couldn't swing a carpenter's hammer because uh, that's way out in the end and that just makes my wrist hurt. But I can swing this mallet all day because it's close to my hand. I've got a lot of good control on it. So my wrist and my arm never tire from a 20 ounce. I also have another, let's say here it is, this here is a 12 ounce and so when I'm doing detail work uh, I use this. So a mallet is used for power like I'm uh, hitting pretty hard here and it's also used for control if I wanted to take and make little light cuts that's what the small mallet is used for control. Um, you see me pounding away on the mantle here with the chisels. Let me explain a little bit. Every time you put a knife or a chisel to the wood, it's like driving a wedge in there. So you see the angle that I'm making here. I am not driving straight in because I don't want to break this off. This is uh, almost a four inch depth. It's right now to about a three inch. and. Uh, if I get in close and drive straight in here, I will put stress and I will crack it. So what I do is I will take it down to depth first, like that, and then I will widen it out. Now, I am not a purist. In other words, a purist, I do use power tools and I will show you that. Another way of roughing this out is with a drill. You can take and drill a couple holes and then uh, that will uh, uh, allow you to get that piece out faster. Let me show you the drill technique. Just a little hand drill and I do use a drill, but it creates a lot of dust. I like the chisels. The chisels are what 
I, it's easier for me to create shapes with chisels and uh, textures with the chisel. So I use the chisels like my paint brushes. But uh, I do use power tools when it's going to speed it up a little bit. You can see how easy it is to get the depth. Because now I'm just breaking off the pieces in between the holes. So that's uh, a faster way to rough things out. But for the rest of the mantle, I don't use power. When I, uh, further in the video, I'll show you how I rough out and uh, do my textures and my finish work, all with using the chisels. When I'm drawing an outdoor picture, the sky plays a significant role because that sets up the mood of the uh, drawing. And uh, in a carving, uh, the sky doesn't play much of a role. It's hard to carve a sky with texture and shape uh, because it looks pretty flat. And uh, so in this case, the sky is roughed out all the way across but it's very narrow, so I have to set the mood of the carving by the shapes and my texture. And so uh, now I'm ready to start roughing in uh, the, and working that background down, but I will start blocking out the masses as I go. So uh, the background is down to about three to four inches all the way across, and uh, it's deep enough now that I can just start working down the, and establishing the ground plane going up. This tool that I'm working with is a V-tool shaped like the letter V and you see the nice uh, stop cut that it created in there. Um, I can come down from this side You can see I'm not trying to follow the lines close. All I'm going to be doing is roughing out the background. I can take the chisels now and just split that wood off in between. Now you can see why I don't spend much time on the drawing. The drawing is gone there. Once I'm down to the bottom of my stop cut, then I go back with the V-tool. Now I'll progressively work that back deeper and deeper. So it'll be shallow in front and it'll be deep in the back. And again, I'll split off the wood. And I keep repeating that process until I get the background down, block out the uh, images and the trees. So you can see how I'm blocking out the objects and establishing this ground plane. So this is about the slope that it's going to go to the background to the foreground. Now the uh, uh, sky, this shelf underneath goes back and it's not flat in the back. What I'm doing is I'm curving it down so it's deeper at the bottom than it is here. So what I don't want is the light to reflect out. I want it to swallow the light so to do that I will not make the surface flat back there. I'll put it on an angle going in. So we're right now about four and a half inches deep right there at that uh, point on the bottom. The other thing I do is I rough that surface up a little bit so that will also diffract the light so it won't come out. So I want that to look uh, uh, like no light is going to reflect out of that like it's a very deep hole like the sky. 
Uh, the other thing is to establish how deep you go. Let's say this object here, it's very difficult to say how deep this is going to be until you establish this here plane. Now once the plane is established, it's easy to determine its depth by this side and this side, you just cut the underside. You know that that sailboat is sitting on the water. So we're just going to block that out. Now I'm going to leave some of the wake and the waves a little bit higher too. I'm not going to go right up to the bottom of the boat. So that's almost down to the depth there now. And probably this whole thing will go in a little bit deeper. You see how I'm maintaining the drawing is I'm following basically the lines. I do stray away from it because I think the sail here maybe needs to widen out and this here bottom part of the sail might stick out over here. What I don't want to do is to uh, make it so weak that we lose his head. Uh, so, uh, uh, so I might extend this beyond to do that. And uh, then like the trees, I get some of the basic shape of the trees. Then before I continue to this next area here, I want to uh, go back and redraw in that far shoreline so I don't lose that. So connect this line with this line and establish where that shoreline was because uh, that part of the drawing is gone. With the loons in the front, I'm going to probably uh, put more loons in so I'm going to block out other areas around the loons. Because I think that area probably needs three loons in it rather than two. After roughing the mantle all the way across, establishing the ground plane, now I'm starting to uh, contour the objects. Now one thing I do with the objects is I tilt them out slightly because that helps with the perspective and it's really not noticeable that they're tilted out slightly but uh, it, it helps in increasing the depth perception. The first time I uh, went across the mantle was to rough out the sky. So that was this portion on the top and I went pretty much to depth. The second time across I established the ground plane. Now the third time going across I'm going to start establishing the depth of the objects. I'm going to outline closer to the objects up next to the line so I don't lose the drawing and then work that object in.
So once I've determined the ground plane, then I start contouring and uh, getting the depth. Uh, then I contour around each of the objects. And um, now I'm doing the, it's going to be a spruce tree. made a comment before about using my chisels like brushes. Let me show you an example. What I'm doing is I'm creating shadows and shapes. And so my, to create these shadows, uh, there are different ways that I use my chisels. For instance, I can take a uh, gouge and not only use it to push it straight forward, uh, or to plunge in, but I can take it and I can rock it. And what that does is that creates some grass, the grass effects, uh, to create the ripples. The water is not flat, so you need a texture on the water. And to put this in, uh, not only do I push my chisels in this direction, but I also slide it across. By going this way, I am taking little slices and making those little waves in the water. See, so it's just taking out just enough to disrupt the surface of that water to make it look like there's ripples. So you can see the difference between this side. This side here hasn't got the texture in. So, um, for instance, the bark on the trees the bark on the trees can be created by a v-tool like this one here going just small cuts right close together or I also take the v-tool and I rock it side to side as I'm going up creating that kind of effect for a different type of bark So there are many ways that you can use a chisel to, uh, just like your paintbrush, to paint in shadows and shapes. To show you some of the texturing techniques, I've got a gouge, fishtail gouge, and um, we need to, the texture is what's going to create the shadows on it. 
and we know a spruce tree has got branches that are coming off like this, and by rocking the chisel, the fishtail, and walking it across the surface, that's what gives me the, some of the texturing for the branches. We know that the spruce tree is not smooth like this. It needs to be, needs to show the branches coming down. Normally I don't just use one technique to put in the shadows. I use several different techniques because besides the branches, this looks too uniform because it looks like it's all the same shade. So if you take a V-tool and create some heavier branches, then it starts adding some realism. Also to the underside because the underside of the branch is not smooth. So by taking the V-tool and carving little chips out of there and some heavier branches on the top, and by doing that all throughout, that makes the uh, tree then start looking like a uh, real spruce tree. This walnut is very nice carving wood. Very consistent grain. Beautiful color. So I'm just rounding this tree off that ends the mantle here. We're coming to the end of the carving process and uh, I have a few hours work left in it and then I will start the finishing uh, by applying a clear coat of varnish. And I don't make sure that all the whiskers are cleaned up and that before I apply the varnish. The first coat of varnish is to see how it looks and then I do some more carving after that. The imperfections show up a lot better with one coat of varnish on and it makes it easier to do the cleanup. This is where I'm rocking the V-tool to make the bark. I will go back with a gouge, also rock the gouge, soften it, make it look more natural. This is just the first base coat of texture. After rocking the V-tool on here to make the bark texture, then this is a gouge and i just softening it up. So what I'm doing is cutting some little lines in it and just kind of taking the harshness off of it just to give it a little bit more softness. Just kind of dancing over the top, very little pressure on it. And 
There, now I'll put the texture in the water and uh, it's going to be ready for our coat of finish. The mantle is finished. The customer is going to pick it up tomorrow. Uh, I want to give a little instructions on how to take care of the mantle. Uh, there are three coats of polyurethane varnish on. The varnish I use is the Minwax. It's the Helmsman. It's an indoor-outdoor product. It's a satin finish, clear satin. Uh, the reason why I use an exterior grade varnish because it has the ultraviolet inhibitors and uh, there's more windows in homes now and plastic skylights and more ultraviolet is coming in the house so an exterior varnish should be used in, inside the house also to protect it from the ultraviolet. So that's why I use an exterior grade varnish on the uh, mantle. And uh, to apply it I use disposable brushes because in some of these areas, I brushed on the, the finish, in some of these areas you're jamming the brush in and that just takes and it ruins a good brush. So that's why I use disposable brushes. After you use a disposable brush and clean it about three times, it no longer loses the bristles. And you need a, a natural bristle brush to apply varnish. If you use a nylon brush, even the brushes that are combination that made for uh, varnish or latex that are still a nylon bristle, they do not work as well. They don't have the surface tension of the bristle to pull that varnish out. The nylon bristle just does not drag the varnish. It drag goes slides through the varnish without spreading it. So that's why you need a natural bristle brush. And the natural bristle brush will break up the bubbles in, uh, and it will smooth it out. It'll stretch the varnish out and then the self-leveling of the varnish will uh, uh, make it smooth and eliminate the brush marks. Um, you can use wax, furniture wax, on the flat surfaces, the top, bottom, and sides of the mantle, but do not use any wax, furniture wax, on the face of the mantle, because you'll never be able to strip the wax off because it is uh, so, much, so textured, heavily textured. So how to clean it is I use a lemon oil without wax. I have, an, again, a bristle brush. Uh, this is a Gloria Jeans brush to clean out the coffee grinders. I bought this at a Starbucks and uh, I use a, a lemon oil. I take and put a little bit of lemon oil on the, uh, on the brush. What I do is I just squeeze up the bottle till a little lemon oil comes to the top. Apply a little lemon oil on the brush and I scrub it right into the surfaces. I go right into the holes and I pull the, that, the dust then sticks to the bristle and it uh, will pull the dust off the mantle. Also it applies a little bit of lemon oil to it which uh, just brightens the mantle up. So the only time you really need to do that is when the mantle is starting to look maybe a little dull from getting the dust in the house. And uh, if the mantle looks nice, uh, then it doesn't need any maintenance. You shouldn't uh, need to uh, dust it very often. Uh, so uh, only when it's looking dull. I uh, appreciate you taking this journey with me. Thank you very much.